Hello everybody, uh, my name is Jan Steffe. Uh, we're here with EHJ today. Um, actually, we're here in Davos at the Cardiology Update. And it's my great pleasure to be joined today by Professor John Cam from London. Um, John, it's great to have you here. It's very good to be here. Excellent. Um, we're here in the mountains, so which is why uh, the, the usual attire would be without ties. So here's the excuse for me not wearing a tie. No, John, obviously, as a uh, senior professor from London, uh, is doing I have tie. no choice. No I choice. like that. I like that. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. John, it's great to have you here. And we'll be discussing um, a very important topic, uh, something that comes up in our daily clinical practice uh, virtually every day. Uh, that's atrial fibrillation. Um, and we're specifically be focusing on the new guidelines, the 2016 guidelines, which just came out a couple of months ago. Now, you obviously, there's a reason why we chose you to discuss this, because obviously you've been chairing the guidelines uh, for many years before. Um, and uh, we'll, we want to touch upon some of the interesting subjects that came out um, are some of the most, let's say, the most maybe uh, practice changing uh, novelties in the guidelines in the 2016 guidelines. So I think it'd be in the interest of our, our viewers, of our audience, um, if we started with the single one therapy that has been shown to reduce morbidity and mortality in atrial fibrillation, that's anticoagulation. So you want to sum up the, what's for you the most important points, the most important novel points in the 2016 guidelines? Well, the 2016 guidelines really concentrated on anticoagulation therapy for atrial fibrillation in order to prevent stroke. The previous guidelines had introduced the so-called non-VKA oral anticoagulants and had introduced uh, scoring schemes for both risk prediction of stroke and risk prediction of bleeding. These guidelines tried to refine what had been previously done. So one thing they said, for example, let's continue to use the CHATSVAS scheme, but let's think very carefully about patients who have a CHATSVAS score of one. And here I'm not including female gender as a point. Mm -hmm. So one point Chadsvask independent of female gender. There have been a number of publications since the last guidelines that have demonstrated that the risk for a patient with a Chadsvask score of one is quite variable, but generally quite low, around a 1% risk per annum of stroke. Mm -hmm. And that's really just at the threshold point for anticoagulation. Mm -hmm. So now we're encouraged to think very carefully about those patients. Mm -hmm. Think, for example, what their risk might be. Let's take age, for example. Mm -hmm. Age 65 to 74, one point on the Chadsvas scheme. But 65-year-old and a 74-year-old, completely different risk of stroke. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take hypertension as another example. Hypertension could mean a short episode of hypertension successfully managed with antihypertensive drugs for some years, or it could mean somebody who has left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, large left atrium, mitral regurgitation. All of this is just one point in the Chadsvas scheme. So that patient, the one with the mitral regurg and the large left atrium is at considerably more risk than somebody with a simple history of treated hypertension. So really different ball games depending on what type of Chad's Vask of one we're talking about. It's not all created equal. You know, adding on to this, because now this is not really in the guidelines yet, but as, as, as we know, there's been some new studies that look uh, with much more granularity at exactly these types of patients, introducing biomarkers as potential aids in helping us uh, to decide. What do you think, um, in my view, this may particularly play a role in those, you know, edge type of patients where you're not sure whether to anticoagulate or not, ABC score, things like that. That's absolutely correct. And, and the guidelines indeed did fire a warning shot, so mm -hmm. to speak, to introduce the concept of using biomarkers for risk stratification. Hasn't made a very formal recommendation, yeah. particularly relating to which specific biomarkers, etc. But clearly, biomarkers are going to refine risk prediction. Mm. We're waiting, however, for some large populations that are not anticoagulated, for example, to properly assess mm. 
the value of using a biomarker, for example, to refine the prediction of the chance fast score equals one patient. Yeah. We don't have that kind of information yet. Mm. We do have a lot of information about biomarkers for predicting the risk of bleeding, for example. Yeah. And it's quite appropriate that we look at an anticoagulated population for doing that. And I'm sure that we will have specific biomarkers recommended in the next guideline. Yeah. But right now, it's just a warning shot. Yeah. Watch this space. Yeah, and so stay tuned for that. Um, you mentioned the bleeding, and I think that's the other important um, message that is sort of a little bit subliminally con con conveyed, but which is nonetheless very important. The Hasblet score, which was introduced uh, during your terms, where you um, uh, created or chaired the guidelines, um, was never meant to prevent patients from receiving anticoagulation. It was always meant to remind us of the modifiable risk factors. And the way that I see it, this has been really termed this way now. The has blood score has really been pushed aside. Well, we're not really pushed aside, but it's not mentioned anymore for gauging patients on whether to anticoagulate or not, right? The problem was the score itself was an encouragement if a high score was reached for the physician not yeah. to anticoagulate yeah. a patient. And that was understandable, but of course many of the bleeding risk factors are yeah. also risk factors for stroke. And so the intention never was to dissuade physicians from yeah. using anticoagulants, but to treat patients with a high score very carefully, mm -hmm. to get them to modify any risk factor that could be changed. For example, drinking too much alcohol, using other drugs that increase the bleeding risk getting with an anticoagulant, getting blood pressure under control, right. for example. Right. So that was part of the meaning of a blood uh, bleeding risk score. The other purpose, of course, is to alert the physician to the fact that the patients do have bleeding risks. Therefore, you can then talk to that patient carefully, make sure they take the right dose of the drug, judge what the right dose is for the patient, educate the patient so that they don't, by chance, start taking other drugs yeah. that might cause bleeding and so on. Mm -hmm. So there are two purposes. One is to find out what factors can be modified now, mm -hmm. and the other is to alert the physician to the bleeding risk specifically for an individual patient. Very important aspects, but really not to dissuade physicians to, st to not start anticoagulation in these patients. Has blood score and CHADS VAS score, as we know, track along very well also with respect to stroke risk. Um, the other thing that is obviously uh, revolutionary in the new guidelines is that one of the drugs that we've been using for ages um, for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation um, is out. Uh, there's no more role for aspirin. There's a class uh, three recommendation for aspirin with an indication of harm. Uh, can you maybe allude on that? Well, I think it's been quite evident for a long time that there was no compelling benefit from using aspirin. Mm. Uh, but the last guideline said, well, you use it if you must, if, if you're not going to anticoagulate a patient, for example. This time, the guidelines are very specific and say it causes harm and no benefit. Therefore, as you say, it's a class three recommendation. Mm -hmm. That really means, it's meant to mean that the physician should not pick aspirin. It's not a soft option. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you can give the patient without a risk of bleeding and with some minor effect on the reduction yeah. of stroke. I think we've, we've all been, and I totally include myself in this for years, for, for over a decade uh, since I've been practicing cardiology, um, we've been overestimating aspirin's efficacy and at the same time underestimating its threats, particularly the bleeding risk. Yeah. And I think that is very well known. That's absolutely right. And the guidelines have made that quite clear yeah. this time. Yeah. So maybe finally to wrap it up, John, I think uh, to, to, to finish with a, with a positive note, uh, the non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants, the NOACs, um, they have really taken center stage for, anti for anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation. They've received a class one recommendation with level of evidence A based on all the randomized clinical trials that we've seen. So really for patients newly started in anticoagulation, this is what we should do. Absolutely, we should. There's a class one level of evidence A recommendation that when an anticoagulant is indicated, the choice is preferably a non-VKA oral anticoagulant. And that is a new feature of these guidelines. There's a secondary recommendation, of course, that patients who are taking warfarin, 
can be chained to a NOAC, particularly mm -hmm. if they have difficulties with uh, keeping in the therapeutic range, but also if the patient prefers a NOAC to a vitamin K antagonist. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very important point. Even those patients on vitamin K antagonists that are doing well, they're not at a 0% risk. On the contrary, we all know that all intracranial bleedings primarily happen, if you take a look at all the intracranial hemorrhages, the majority happens in the therapeutic range. Over three quarters, 80% in Aristotle happen in the therapeutic range, so it's not benign even then. Absolutely. And we only know minor things like controlling hypertension to reduce ICH. Yeah. So, so I think it's a really very important that if we have a therapy that is associated with much less intracranial hemorrhage and no acts as a group are reduce intracranial hemorrhage compared with warfarin by 50%, mm -hmm. then that is something that we should act on. And these guidelines do just that. Absolutely. Well, John, I guess we could easily continue for another hour. Unfortunately, our time's already up. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a huge pleasure as always uh, having you here with us. I thank you very much and I thank you everybody for watching.